Okay, well, without any further ado, um, welcome to the second day of uh, the Eurozine Conference. I hope you've enjoyed the change of venue. Uh, interesting contrast to yesterday's venue. Um, without me sort of waffling on for long, we'll start straight away, I think, with the first panel. And uh, the moderator is Mary Fitzgerald. Thank you, Mary. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Can you all hear me? Um, so, uh, today, as with the rest of the conference, we are dealing with the small problem of whether internet and digital technology is a good thing or a bad thing for democracy, and we um, aim to answer this question fully um, and completely in the next hour and a half. Um, I'm, uh, I'm from Open Democracy. We are an independent uh, global media platform uh, that challenges power and inspires change. Um, and I apologize in advance if I'm slightly fuzzy today because um, most of the last week I have been awake light. Okay, which has all kinds of uh, very interesting links to, uh, as one MP put it in the House of Commons this week, uh, potential foreign interference um, and uh, we have been trying to tell some of that story this week um, and I think this actually relates um, quite well to what we're talking about today because what our work has shed some light on and what um, particularly the work of Carol Cadwaller at The Guardian and a number of other um, journalists and investigators working in, uh, on this subject in different parts of the world have begun to shed light on is the uh, international dimensions of so much of what we think of as uh, local or national campaigning um, and um, local or national politics, um, even in so-called um, de democracies, in, in so-called robust democracies where we have so-called free press and so on and so on. Um, and, uh, and of course this all links quite uh, neatly back to this idea of um, what digital technology is doing for democracy and what it might not be doing for democracy. Um, a lot of the funding that we're looking at um, the secret sources for, um, it's quite clear that there are links with um, Rob the Robert Mercers of this world, um, the Cambridge Analyticas, um, you know, the Russian state and non-state actors, um, and so on. And, uh, and I think that, that leads us quite, quite, quite nicely into this theme um, of whether we are getting closer to what, what we might define as democracy or not um, through some of the technologies um, that, we, that we're using in our politics and in our civic communications. Um, so without further ado, I think I'd like to introduce um, our first panelist, um, Dimitri Hutki, who, Hutki oh, I think is going to tell us a story. Um, well, you're going to explain the context of, what, of the work you're doing, um, but I hope that you're going to tell us some stories about um, reasons to be hopeful, things that citizens and technologists are trying to do, um, which are actually advancing um, and deepening um, people's democratic and civic participation. But you're going to explain a little bit about um, the need for that as well. Sure. <laughs> um, so, you know, in our uh, kind of in classic meaning, uh, classic world, uh, people would vote for representatives and say, okay, you're uh, our deputies, you do the job, uh, kind of it's a representative democracy. Uh, but it's not working anymore. I mean, people uh, have uh, low trust in governance, uh, they are protesting, they are dissatisfied, so uh, the governments want, uh, you know, legitimacy, so they kind of seek for some solutions, and people also do grassroots activities, and they come up with some tools. Uh, so, uh, what, what are the options? If we take this uh, kind, of, uh, kind of classic theme of uh, transparency, uh, accountability, participation in civic education, now we have hosts of tools. Uh, like authorities, they usually go the easy way. They kind of make websites, they sometimes can go to streaming, making kind of feedback uh, online uh, forms, and that's it. But again, that's not enough. Like only like telling something is, is it's not what people want. People want to be heard. People want that their thoughts and inputs are considered. This is, this is what they feel satisfied. So they develop grassroots initiatives and they go much further. Um, if we take on another perspective, uh, like uh, impacting policy making cycle, then on agenda setting there are, I mean, authorities don't offer that much, 
Sometimes if they want to make a strategy for a city, for example, they might invite locals, like I've been to Saloniki, Greece, and they have co-developed like that thick strategy involving like 1,000 stakeholders and develop it for a month. And it's like a massive strategy for 2020 and it's grassroots and it's um, kind of inclusive. So it's a good job. This is how you can set up an agenda. But sometimes people have to push for that. Uh, like in Ukraine, after all this revolution, you know, like in wild ways, kind of uh, the, the, the regime was changed, but, but what's next? You know, you can't always go to, to Maidan and kind of uh, throw kind of stones and fire into, into, into uh, officials. Like now we have like uh, elected, democratically elected officials whom you supposed to deliver these functions, so what's next? And people decided to make, uh, to unite for, for reforms. And like, uh, I'm a member of uh, alliance of 80 organizations who have agenda for 20 reforms. And we regularly meet with deputies. Uh, we collect uh, ideas from, from, from the citizens and we promote this agenda. But again, this is like working national level. On, on, um, from the citizen side, we uh, advocated a law on e-petitions. And there, where people can have their say directly. So they say, we want, for example, uh, our right of self-defense be uh, set up in the laws. And 25,000 people will sign up for that. And the president had to deal with that. Of course, he uh, kind of tried to evade that question, but still, people had their voice. And that thing was a boom, so it was a hype. Uh, but again, only kind of saying what we want is not enough. So agenda setting is just one thing. The next stage is policy formulation, uh, formulation and deliberation. Like, uh, let's, let's agree on what we want. And there we have all these e consultations, uh, uh, online fora, or kind of more systematized ways. You have the heavy in Estonia, where they have kind of uh, themes where the people can react uh, and uh, set up their objectives. Um, and finally, uh, if there is uh, like all this uh, e-referenda, e-voting is, is coming, then we have e-participation, like really uh, direct participation in decision making. Like for me, that's the most important stage where people uh, implement the right for direct democratic participation. Uh, for example, you can vote for some uh, policies, uh, you can uh, go for a referenda, and then it becomes like uh, mandatory, you can make, uh, you can vote uh, at elections, um, and many, many other stuff. Uh, but again, making a decision is not enough. The next stage is implementation. And there where you need kind of crowdsourcing of ideas, crowdfunding, even co-implementation. And finally, monitoring and control. This is where, again, Many people don't go that far, but still, um, there are, for example, public funds. And with public funds, they need to be controlled. Many countries provide just overall description of budgets. This part is for education, this part is for health. Again, not enough. Uh, in Ukraine, we made it mandatory so that every public transaction is published online. I mean, every public spending transaction. So you can see how much this pay for a, uh, for a package of paper. And if they pay, like, not $1, but $100, something's wrong. And you can prosecute that uh, kind of authority which did that. So that's one way of controlling everything online. They have to report. If they misreport, they will be prosecuted. If they don't report, they will also face some responsibility. So uh, the point is to, to have a kind of influences this whole policy making cycle at all stages online and offline because sometimes online is also not enough you need to go to authorities and have real dialogue uh, one one solution which is working well and covering all these stages is participatory budgeting because this is where you engage people at all stages they have their voice set and they really control authorities and actually work uh, cooperate with them, collaborate till, uh, till the very end. Um, so what's the idea? <clears throat> the idea, uh, it originated in Brazil, it's a classic story. Um, so they had, uh, people voted for a kind of leftist government 
And when they came, they had the, the promise that people would participate in uh, urban uh, planning, in urban uh, solving uh, these issues in towns. Uh, so they made a huge movement out of that. So in Porto Alegre, they they discussed in these small districts and towns what priorities do they have, what they want to do, what they want to change. They submitted these suggestions. Um, so people voted, uh, and uh, the mayor he said, yes, okay, let's do that. So uh, the part of budget was distributed as people directly said, not how the representatives thought that it's, it should be, but what people want. If they don't want, for example, a new football stadium, which might be good for PR for some politician, but they want a new school, they will have a new school, and that's what they want. Uh, so this model spread to the whole Brazil, and they had even kind of nationwide planning, and there's people like uh, this model, and they copied it in the U.S., like in New York and Chicago. Uh, so I was I was studying that in, in Wisconsin. Uh, like I went to Chicago, I discussed with experts, and I was excited by this model. And I came back to Ukraine, and my whole town, hometown is doing that. Imagine, like I said, wow, there's such an advanced model, and it turns out like a small town which is like roughly the size of Tartu, they, uh, they, they copied this model. Well, Polish uh, colleagues helped them. So that movement was really, uh, is really wide, uh, widespread in Europe, like uh, in France, Portugal, uh, Poland, again. Um, the, the people are doing that. Uh, so the idea is that uh, people meet in their small communities and really hard, harshly deliberate what they want to change around them. So they set up priorities and then vote and submit this to local authorities. And local authorities then have to implement this. Of course, this is within the frame of some budget. Usually it's kind of 1% to 5% of these uh, regular expenses. Um, sometimes uh, the uh, authorities do that. Sometimes people do it themselves. Uh, and they monitor and see how it's working, when it's done, and they're happy. Um, in, in Ukraine, in Kyiv, we made it more like a show, maybe, in a way. So at first, at first the story was uh, kind of going really uh, dim and, and dark and kind of classic, um, let's say, corrupt and untransparent way, because the uh, authorities thought, OK, let's do this thing. It's popular. We can make some uh, PR on that. And they introduced it, but it was uh, it was no direct voting. They would select themselves these projects. And you know there is uh, always this way for kind of questionable nepotism or other practices. Like if they choose, like that subjective choice. So our activists activists knew about that, and they made a huge kind of protest. Like what's happening? It's our money. We don't want that. So they kind of frightened authorities said, no, we'll rewrite it. They made for every week they were meeting, like in a hub, in a smart city hub, for debating for like for nights. And they uh, developed a new new regulation. And they submitted, authorities said, this is what we want. And there were some negotiations, but final authorities voted. And it was really participatory. So, uh, uh, so this is advertised on the website, then authors any, any, anywhere can, can submit their projects. They can be as innovative as kind of high-tech programming and startups hub, or as simple as making some festival. It like depends on, uh, on the author. So it's kind of self-organization competition about among smart people. Like if in a city of two and a half million, we have enough of this, uh, of these guys. So. And people advertise them in social media and everywhere. This project, they come only technical check, like if they're doable. For example, if the land belongs to, to, to the city community, if they have enough funds, like fit the budget and everything. They can't reject a project based on their subjective kind of thoughts. Um, then uh, if they are pass this technical check and they have like a minimum of 200 kind of pre-voting, then they put up for official voting. And then when we have like uh, real projects fair, actually right now in Kyiv, there is a kind of project fair happening. So they are bringing all these, uh, some artifacts from, from, the, uh, from what they want to do. Sometimes these are digital. And people kind of immerse uh, in the reality they want to create. If it's a high-tech hub, 
they will see what they can do there. How can they interact with the MVP products developed? Or if it's kind of uh, some creative stuff, they can uh, check the, 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 the artwork which already being done there. Uh, so then people, the reason like in ping, people vote. And like those projects which were like the top and fit the budget, they are supported. Last time we had like 60 projects supported uh, in the previous cycle. And part of them are already implemented. Like we have, um, uh, we have uh, gone some festivals, we have uh, started this kind of cleaning of uh, lakes around town. So this is what, uh, this is happening. I mean, um, authors of projects form their teams, they cooperate with authorities. And the thing is, in, in this, in this uh, process, they actually, um, you know, learn how to listen to each other. They, they do something together. So finally, this is like totally new quality of citizen authorities collaboration. It's not just uh, writing some, uh, some document as, uh, or some appeal. It's real work together. And actually some authors of the projects, they become uh, publicly known figures. They, they are uh, widely recognized. Some of them go into municipality. They become, uh, they, they want to join the other side. They, they feel that they can change more, that they have these skills. They have popular support. So um, hundreds of new leaders actually emerge in this process. And they are huge human resource for that, for, cha for urban change. In Kyiv, uh, 200,000 uh, residents voted. It's like almost 10% of the whole population, sorry, not voted, but um, participated in, uh, in all these campaigns. They registered for the website, they looked at the projects. Uh, 50,000 people uh, voted. Well, it's big enough to claim that these were kind of supported by people. Uh, and, um, and, and what now? What's next? Well, the next uh, uh, come the challenges, because now authorities, they realized that this is a threat. This is a threat to their power. So they want to change the regulation again. They want to make it controlled, vertically, uh, vertically controlled, and um, again, uh, decide by their kind of expert panel from, uh, from the municipality, which is not right. Because if you delegate the power to the people, you shouldn't be able to take it away. So now we're having a next cycle of advocacy campaign to keep the regulation as it is and to keep this model which is inspiring other towns. So when I came back from the United States to Ukraine, there were like three, three towns who were practicing this. But now we have over 150 towns who are doing this participatory budgeting. And this is a huge experimental field. Imagine every town is consulting with somebody, with some NGO, some international partners. They are practicing different models, different like uh, ID uh, mechanisms, like ID cards, uh, bank ID, mobile ID, uh, city of the resident. The, some of some of citizens discuss in these localities. Some of them just rely on leaders. Some delegate implementation to authorities, some implement themselves, some co-implement, uh, some monitor online, same go with demand, some you know, receipts from authorities. They, uh, they made really good, proper tenders. So this is like, you know, like self-organization. It's a game of, game of life, game of democracy. Like they, 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 they are doing that. And there is more because we have 450 towns. So only one third joined by, uh, by now but more will join and they will take their most kind of popular models. So there are challenges and there are benefits. So what are the benefits? For citizens, they have a raised quality of life. Uh, they, they decide what they want. Uh, they, uh, they kind of know that they have uh, impacted the city. For authorities, they have their legitimacy uh, reestablished. They actually divide the responsibility with the citizens because when they, they do on their own, they always can be criticized that you did this, we didn't want that. And they can be, they, they might not be reelected for the next cycle, but, but, but with this, they engage people already. Uh, and the community overall benefits in a way, they have crowdsource of ideas, they have crowdfunding, for example, international donors can help 
um, citizens invest, um, uh, authorities invest. So this is kind of multiplication of investments in urban development. And people d develop this kind of culture of joint action. They, they don't feel that, I mean, we are citizens, you authorities have to fight. Uh, they realize that we are partners, like uh, we are going to this municipal office of this responsible person, like as, as he's a colleague or a friend, I mean, uh, just open the doors, go there and discuss real issues in a kind of working model. No kind of political games, no kind of persuasion. We just debate like it's, it's our joint task. It's totally different. It feels differently. Um, and uh, so I would say that this model is worth implementing. It's really kind of uh, a field of, of course, of some struggle, of some uh, negotiations, trust, mistrust, but, uh, but it's working. Thank you very much. That was a very um, positive and optimistic way to start the morning, which is what, exactly what I was hoping for. Thank you very much. Um, I've got lots of questions, and I'm sure lots of um, the panelists and audience do too, but um, we'll, we'll all do our initial addresses, and then we'll come back to some of the questions um, I've noted down. So having... Having had that um, positive, optimistic, constructive look forward, <laughs> um, I'm going to hand over to Vladan uh, Yola to, um, uh, to, to zoom the lens back a little bit. Um, we've been talking about micro, we've been talking about lo the local, um, we've been talking um, about municipal initiatives. Um, and I wanted to ask you to um, zoom out a little bit and talk about some of the um, issues, challenges, opportunities with technology at the global um, multinational level. <laughs> okay. Good morning. So the good news is that I'm not going to be on every panel so, because I was the last one yesterday and the first one this morning, but I will leave in a in, in few minutes, I hope. So, so in my kind of like dyslectic manner, I was like reading this uh, title of this panel discussion and for me <clears throat> why it was interesting because I was reading in a bit different way for, for me it's like so uh, accessing the political potential of internet technologies it was more like uh, uh, like po internet for me it's more about uh, uh, democracy within internet and and and, uh, and this idea that, that basically you cannot use internet as a tool for democracy, if internet by itself, it's not democratic. And so this is something that is kind of bothering me in, in the last few years. And, and, but the, the, the problem of, of making internet as itself democratic, it's not so easy. It has like a lot of different layers, technical layers, uh, governance layers, and, and, and lots of different complex issues that, that we don't deal with most of the time. So we most of the time think that, okay, now we have this internet and now this internet is going to change like our lives, but sometimes, time to time, we realize that it's not so uh, easy. For example, now we had, uh, we have this situation in, in Barcelona, for example. So how, if internet, like a Thing, platform, whatever it is, is democratic, then there will be no possibility for, for example, Spain to block internet access to some of the websites. Because why Spain now should have a role in that? Because internet is something else. So now we realize that internet itself is like governed on different levels, different ways. And, 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 and in the last few years, we were, we were investigating in different kind of dark places of, of, of untransparency. And if we are speaking about the internet, most of the things it's completely not transparent. So most of the time we are speaking about, you know, like, uh, I don't know, these terms, for example, cloud or social media platforms, but we have no idea how these things functioning and, and are they by themselves democratic or not? So, in our some of our research, deal with with some of those like layers of, of invisibility, and 
And I think this is the main question that we should ask, how we can make internet more democratic before we start to, to use internet as a tool for changing uh, democracy all over the world. So, and then there is like, so this is one segment that, that, that we are really interested in. Another one, it's something that, that more and more I'm, I'm going deeper into this researching data and, 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 and uh, I'm starting to be more and more aware of data as a tool of uh, oppression. And, and, and this is this kind of the loose point of view of uh, uh, individuals and individuals. And basically, the idea is that we are uh, kind of transforming into individuals. That means that there is another layer of ourself that is part of some kind of data banks. So we as, a, as, a, as, a, as a individuals are, are kind of managed through different data banks. And, and, and those data banks are starting our means of, of control of society over us as an individuals. So uh, for me, for example, what is, where is the moment in which those data banks that are now everywhere, they're not just within like government structures, but we are also being part of the data bank within Facebook, within Google, within like many of these big players on the internet, how they are now those data banks starting to be uh, a means of oppression over us. So for example, yeah, I think yesterday I gave some uh, example of, of this when you, the moment when your Facebook profile start to be used or misused by the government to let you, for example, in United States or, or give you visa or not give you visa. Or for example, the moment when your Facebook profile start to be used as a tool for, for like uh, when you are applying for a job, they're watching your Facebook profile and so on and so on. So, and, and basically this moment of, of uh, in which we are, we are kind of, uh, push to, 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 to build those uh, uh, um, some kind of parallel identities that we are building on the internet, for example, on Facebook profiles, LinkedIn profiles, and so on, in which those identities are starting to be part of like dialogue between us and state and, and everything. So those are the few places that, that I see. Uh, so this, this is like some kind of second uh, uh, drama that I'm seeing. <laughs> and the third one, it's like those uh, uh, different forms of black boxes and, 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 and uh, in which, for example, now we, we hope, for example, that Facebook and Google, that are some kind of over-national beings, they're like more close to nature than to being a companies. And by that, a lot of governments also like looking forward to Facebook to, to solve their problem. And then, for example, now we have this issue with the fake news and then a lot of people are like, but why Facebook doesn't solve this problem of fake news? You know, why they, they're so clever, you know, they can make those algorithms that now they can understand what is truth, what is lie. And that's, that's kind of really dangerous place that, that, that we are in, in which, you know, we have now for example, in, in, I don't know, we have a democracy on like a lot of kind of places. For example, I don't know, in Serbia, we have elections. Already. But we don't have elections for, for Facebook and for Google and stuff. And we rely on them as they are some kind of uh, superpower. And also governments rely on them to solve the, the, the problems of, of our society. But back, back, uh, back on the uh, issue of black boxes, more and more problems are going to be solved in, in the future by those black boxes, like this idea that now Facebook sh should know what is true, what is uh, lie. And, and now with this issue of, of artificial intelligence and everything that is coming, it's going to be like also probably part of some kind of democratic process or, or decision making and so on. 
it is really important to try to understand how those machines are making uh, decisions. Because if, we, if, if transparency is one of the, the, the values that we are seeing in democracies, this transparency should be also there when we are speaking about technology and tools that we are using for achieving democracy. So that's my kind of like bit probably confusing talk, but <laughs> I threw a few points and I hope this will become some kind of discussion maybe, I don't know. Again. Thank you very much, that, that was very good, thank you. Um, again, I've got lots of questions and we'll go to our final um, uh, panelist and then, and then we'll come back and have a discussion about all these points. So our final panelist, um, Mario Laristin, I've asked her to talk particularly about, given all these challenges and opportunities uh, that we face with new digital, t digital technologies, uh, what do we need to do in terms of education? Um, I don't mean that just what do teachers need to teach in schools, but how do we, as a culture, as society, educate ourselves and learn and think, think differently and think critically? Um, in what's been kind of the, one of the biggest revolutions um, of the last, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. I feel like um, our education systems and our ways of speaking to each other and solving problems um, are really now completely out of date. And I'd love you to talk a little bit about that as well as anything else you wanted to discuss in relation to this theme. <clears throat> Thank you very much uh, uh, bringing in this issue of education because when I hear that somebody is saying, oh, we don't understand, then for me, it means that, oh, then you need education. <laughs> because how you can improve situation if you don't understand only through learning something. And uh, when we speak about technology and say, oh, we don't understand technology, and for that is frightening, then what we should know about this technology? What, what do you mean if you say technology should be transparent? Uh, when you enter the airplane, is it transparent? No. You just trust it. You just buy a ticket. You're not going to engine to, to, to control how it's working. Uh, and, and here we are. We are in this uh, more and more complex world. There is more and more machines around us. And machines, not only technological machines. Uh, when I, being now uh, three years in European Parliament, in the place about what I didn't have much of understanding before I came there, then I, I, I can tell you that, that uh, people, almost all, understand about European Parliament, how it's working, as, as say, as, as scarcely, even maybe less, than they understand about computers. Because it's also a machine. It is a machine with its own, say, inner links and, and, and processes which are organized in some way and so on. And um, uh, so my, my, my thesis when I think about the things is that really education, what we have now, educational system in, 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 in all our civilization, it is an old one, you know? It, it, it is coming back to, to Aristotle to thousand years. And uh, it was really created and developed uh, to prepare uh, kids, but also people who are coming from other societies, to, to, to feel themselves confident, to, to cope, to, to be active in this environment. And now we have suddenly environment around us which is absolutely different. Uh, and our task when we are social scientists doing our research, the first task is to explain what is the difference? What is the difference? Because yes, we can say, oh, now we have machines and we didn't. But, but when we look at pyramids, they also had some machines. So, so what kind of machines? What, what's the difference? And, and uh, there are two things where now social science is really focusing. Uh, and they are interlinked. One is complexities. Uh, the real, the, the level of, of all different inputs, the all different layers which are functioning together, creating enormous complexity of this environment. And uh, from other side, speed. That all these things are going on with more and more speed. And as we well know, uh, this is called, oh, we are now 
moving from analog world to digital world. Okay, but is our education moving? Is education moving along? Is education preparing as kids, as us, all of us, uh, to cope with this much more complex and, and much, much more speedy world? And then we are heard, oh, we, we help you. We bring in computer. Computer can do it for you. He, he has high speed of processing, more and more speed, more and more megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, and then it will be very helpful. And then you come and say, oh, I'm frightened. I don't understand a cue about that. And I feel that I am some kind of input. I am a database, like you said, and I don't understand what's how and how, how it is in influencing my world. And then we, we, we start to ask, but, but then what I can do? Because the idea of democracy is that all of us have some kind of access, the kind of participation in the processes which are going on. We have some role in decision making. Then how we then can master this technological, technologically really, not technological, but the technologically saturated world. That, that's what we used to say in social science now, the technologically saturated world. <laughs> how, how we can master it and how to, to use this technology uh, really then as some kind of stick or some kind of, of tool which will help us, not, not really make us feel small and helpless, but give us some kind of new power. And you said that internet is not democratic in itself. Nothing is democratic in itself. Person also is not democratic in itself. Every family has a problem that fathers want to dominate, or kids were taken over, are taking over. So you see, that, that, is, a, that is in, yeah, that there, is a, there are some, some rules, and we have used to that. And then for, for, for father, it could be absolutely undemocratic when mother would say that not, now it's my turn to decide. But you say, no, give mother also part of the budget. So, so, and then we change the institution of the family. So uh, uh, the other question, the first, my question is how to change education, though that it help us to, to know, to understand, and to act. And the next question is, then, if we know and understand, will we be satisfied with these institutions? Uh, because what you described uh, in your examples, you try to change institutions, you try to change some kind of settings. And uh, give here more openness, people opportunities to decide about things they didn't uh, before and so on, like budget. Yeah, budget is always been taken as something old, it's very special, it's financial, you know, it's financial. But, but now we see, yeah, budget is social, yeah? And, and, and that, seem, that seems to me that uh, uh, we, we have to think about these things uh, together because empower people, but then also give them tools how to use their empowerment in decision making. It doesn't mean that we here have made decision about technology so much. It's make decision about power itself, about power distributed, how the power is working. And then we come to third thing, which is really close to the hearts of people who are here. I suppose it's a mediation or mediatization, how we call it. Mediation on the first stage, meaning that we don't communicate with each other only in these nice settings where we can see each other, but we communicate through different media and then use them and then trust or don't trust them. And then we speak now about mediatization, not mediation, mediatization, where Again, we see how this so-called media logic, media themselves are taking over. Not that they media, media, are media for us, but we are some kind of content for them. Again, like database, yeah? So it's, a, it's a, the, the same kind of thing. And when we look now at the internet and look now at, for example, the Twitter, because internet is so, it's, a, it's really the, the environment. But then when we take Twitter, yeah? then Twitter already is taking over. It's taking over not because it's technology, but, but because it is certain kind of institution. There are certain rules. For example, length of the message. It's not 
set up by technology. You can send in the internet message, you can read three months. But no, it is speed and it is institutional setting, so to make more, say, I don't know than what, effect, profit, whatever, uh, from this tool. And we agree with that. We all go that, and then we use to that, then we, then we use, and we, oh, in, Twitter is a very nice thing, we can links, send links over, and then, the, and then we mediate uh, the content from other media. And then come, not machines, but people. I have seen them in, in Brussels uh, very often, very powerful gentlemen uh, in, sit, sitting down and say, oh, uh, now we want to control this process of linking. We want to put here rules so that our profits, what we have been using to do before internet, will be safe for us also in time of internet. Internet has nothing to do with that. And, 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 and then that is the powers these gentlemen have really created and collected in the previous time, before internet. And here we see how this technology's possibility, for example, to quickly link us with different sources, different uh, texts and so on, is, is really blocked uh, by institutional settings and by people who have used this setting for their power. And, and now we have this, again, situation where now old institutions are actively really intervening in changing new institutions to be more democratic. So we are in the real world. We are not in... in inside technology. We are in society. And, and uh, for that, I suppose the most say, challenging, uh, <clears throat> challenging now is uh, to have real, say, real deliberation, uh, analysis about these things, how these old settings, old institutions, uh, old type of educational process, uh, how, to, how it is uh, uh, related or where are those black holes or conflicts or contradictions which, which really create for us the situation where we feel ourselves, you see, like in a fairy tale. Because I think that's not uh, just occasional that uh, when you look at the, the, all this uh, tendency to create uh, movies which are creating some kind of fairy tale environments, all those games of thrones and everything, and people like go there and feel that oh now there they 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 really they are free of this really <laughs> bad real world. Uh, I suppose it's reflecting this feeling. It's a bit like a feeling of the some maybe native native uh, people in the very beginning of humankind. In, in, in a jungle or in a cave, that there is a terrible world outside and terrible forces outside. And then we, we, we be here in our cave and tell each other fairy tales to, to, to cope with that in, in our psychological, mental world. So I think that uh, in this sense, yes, we, we have to come out from the cage. <laughs> to, to look at these machines, they're not so, so terrible, really. <laughs> they could be domesticated, but for that we really need, at first, uh, yes, different, different education, different knowledge, different analytical tools, and then we have really have democratic freedoms to change things, to make really decisions about those things. And I am glad to tell you, uh, looking at or listening to your concerns of being database, uh, that uh, what what. <clears throat> we, and personally me too, are doing just now uh, in uh, this European level of, of legislation. Uh, we, uh, this week, uh, really voted for new regulation on e-privacy. And <clears throat> we will want to put really end on that, that all of us could be used as database for, for any other internet giants or not giants, even uh, startups, because up to now, the situation was that uh, these privacy rules, which are so natural for us in the analog world, we are not just going into any other person's home without knocking, without asking. We know it's a private, it's private. But in digital environment, there are not such rules. It's, it's, this culture is not developed, and no laws also. 
And what you're trying to do is now to, to create the laws which really forbid usage of this kind of data for what you mentioned, this kind of profiling. Also, if you look at Brexit or Trump, then this really, really cruel usage of this data. And already in, in already past, the general legislation, general data, uh, personal data protection regulation, there is a clear, say, paragraph, article, that any kind of automated processing of personal data cannot be used for decision making about this person, be it on the workplace or be in the bank and any other place. And it will be, the general rule already is passed, it will be implemented on 25th of May next year. And uh, I will say <coughs> that working on this, uh, why I mentioned those gentlemen who are really disturbed about those changes, it is, it is ferocious, enormous, aggressive and cruel pressure what they are really putting uh, against this kind of legislation which will curb their, their really freedoms to use our data and to use technologies for their, their interest. And, and, and that's their business model. And, and they say, they are coming by gods, you say, and how you can decide something which is changing our business model? You know, it's like a final statement. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, but people who are being fighting for these things, or <coughs> privacy, as human rights, uh, they also have now learned how to answer. And our answer is that, that if there is a business model which is violating fundamental human rights, then really you must change this business model. And I suppose that's very important. And then here I end with education. Uh, uh, what is the problem here? That majority of people, uh, even in Europe, even in the West, they don't care and know, don't know much about their basic human rights. <laughs> and that's one part of education. And uh, this education is going also through the cases. And uh, there is a very important case, I don't know if journalists know about that, the so-called Schrems case, the case of brave Austrian student who, who went in court in this situation where he discovered that his data were misused. And, the, and he achieved the victory uh, through the European Court of Justice over the whole system of uh, Europe, American uh, business data transfer, and its system was stopped in 24 hours. And it stopped already a year because there haven't been anything better proposed. So that's a force, that's a power of one brave, young, informed, knowledgeable young people, person. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to open this up to questions very soon because um, I'm conscious that we want to give time for that. I'm going to ask one thing of the panelists and, and feel free to respond to as much or as little of this as you want to. Uh, and it's, there's two parts to it. The first is that um, I feel like I'm so encouraged by many of the things that you describe. But I wanted to ask you about participation rates um, and also about, I mean, you say you call 10% a high participation rate. And also this made, this, this it reminded me of I used to work at Prospect Magazine, and we had this competition every year um, for the world's top 100 public intellectuals. And it was this thing that, you know, we'd list all these Nobel Wise Prize winning economists would be on it every year and great thinkers. And we thought, um, this must have been seven or eight years ago, or maybe nine years ago, um, why don't we open this up to the public and so the public, you know, our readers can vote. Oh, we're so, you know, high tech. <laughs> why don't we get people who read and enjoy Prospect to, to nominate people themselves and vote on them? Uh, so it turned out that Fatula Gulen, <laughs> um, who uh, people probably know more about now because, um, because of Erdogan's repression in Russia, but Fatula Gulen, who is um, uh, an Islamic cleric based in outside of Philadelphia, I believe, won this by an absolute landslide because there was a concerted campaign to have him be the world's top public intellectual. And there was just, you know, it was one of those little initiatives that got massively co-opted um, by a special interest group. Um, I, I take this example, but they're, they're everywhere. I mean, it, you know, part, Democrat parties, political parties that open um, up their membership to um, a democratic process of electing their 
their um, their leader. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the leader that, that gets results of this is the leader that's going to be the, the leader that the people in the country are going to want to vote for or choose. Because again, you know, a lobby group, a series of lobby groups, a series of campaign groups can come together and, and own that process and co-op that process, much the way this has always happened, right? There's always been processes and groups and special interest groups which have co-opted or managed democracy in one way or another. I don't think the technology has has really made that any more or less likely to happen. There, there are just new methods and new ways of doing it. So I wanted to put that question to, to all of you, which is, can do democracy just be co-opted in many of the traditional ways that it always has been? And then I wanted to ask as well about um, both of your reactions to this new EU initiative and, and where you see the problems, where you, particularly where you see the problems and the opportunities, but, but to put that to all of you. So feel free to respond to as much or as little as that as you want to, and then we'll open it up to, to um, audience questions. Yeah, I'd like to reply, <laughs> like, what percentages? It's a really good question, like, uh, is it uh, high or low? So what I have found in my studies is, like, there is a magic number. <laughs> like, uh, usually in terms of participation, like, around 10% take part. So it's good. Kind of what's minus. a legitimate participation, huh. I suppose? Like, you know, if, if what number or what percentage would you consider to be... A legitimate expression of civic engagement and participation. Mm. Well, these are uh, these active people. You can't make people active like uh, forcefully by the outside. It's the inner push. It's their motivation. So you just have to live with that. Like in Ukraine, we know that around five percent of people participated in some kind of uh, civic action, like in the streets. You know, and even at Maidan, nationwide, only twelve percent participated. You know. So this kind of, in, in voting, you know, you can have like 50, 60 percent, you know, sometimes some European countries as low as 30 percent. So you have to live with that, <laughs> you know. Uh, I suppose it's a challenge, though. It's like, how, how do you encourage those rates to, to rise? What, what more can be done? Because uh, obviously more participation is desirable, presumably, because it, it gets around this idea of special interest groups co-opting or a process. Yeah, you should work with kind of leaders of public opinion. I mean, if, if it's kind of a point of interest that people will go to television, they will speak up, they will mobilize their networks. That's the thing. So each uh, leader of public opinion has his own like followers, proponents, uh, and alliance. And of course, it can be co-opted. Like our president used the very smart tactics. I mean, his, uh, his uh, administration would invite bloggers for kind of uh, morning coffee <laughs> and discuss internal affairs uh, uh, in the way they want them to see. And bloggers will say, wow, have kind of internal information, you know? Uh, so they would kind of, uh, like insiders, and they will uh, make blog posts uh, with the perspective that the president administration would like them to see. That's the co-opting of civic uh, participation. And that's always happened. That used to be, you know, that the, the lobby journalists, you know, it's, this is an age-old tactic, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you can do this even digitally. Like, sometimes they, um, I, super high-tech technology, they make kind of fake um, people on Facebook who make, who make friends with bloggers. And these friends kind of throw in some themes. And bloggers, at some point, they catch up with one of these themes and start writing as if it was uh, his or her own opinion. So that's how you can impact like even a person's agenda. This is manipulative tactics and it's used. So this is a struggle. Like, uh, they try to input, people try to contract. The good thing with kind of local authorities, civic activists and people are more advanced technologically. So authorities kind of try to catch up so we're kind of a bit ahead in terms of promoting these civic participation tools. But of course, some governments uh, or kind of uh, political forces, they are high tech and they can use some manipulative things and then people learn from them and then these parties are ahead. Like uh, big companies as well being a great example. Yeah. So, uh, yes, um, Vladim, feel free to respond to whichever bits of what I just said <laughs> you want to respond to. Yeah, okay. I, I think I will... I... So my, I have a kid that is seven years old, and, and I think last year or two years ago, him and his friends, they were completely into Minecraft. And first they were playing at home, and like everything was great, and then they were pushing me, yeah, 
Can you make us like Minecraft server servers so we can like join together and play together? And said, so, okay. So I made them a server. And so first they came there. It's multiplayer world, online world. And first the, the one kid started to destroy everything with explosives. Then the other one said, oh, no, don't do that. So they came up with the first rule, do not use explosive on other people's property. Then the second one was something about like invisibility or like, you know, so they were starting to create their own form of cohabitation in this virtual world, their, their own version of democracy. And, but then my kid realized that, okay, because I, like his father, like superhuman being, have also su superhuman powers because I am administrator of the server. <laughs> and then, and he asked me, okay, what you can do? And I checked there so I can turn day into night, I can kill people, ban people, I can do whatever I want on, on this server. So as he, because he, it's his like account. So I said, okay, now we are going into some danger zone. You know, like now you are, have like God abilities there. You should, you know, there is like responsibility. You can just cannot kill people, kick people or do whatever. And this went well. And then they said, okay, install me something like some kind of like thing from outside of the world, some kind of special toilet code. And then this special toilet became like the only toilet in the game and created economy because all of them started to fight uh, around this toilet. And then one kid copied somehow this <laughs> toilet and did the OS server. And that was the end, you know. <laughs> and so, and there is like in this story, there is like everything, you know, like you have like democracy, you have position of, of superpower because in, in, in world there is a, a administrator power, it's a power of Google, power of Facebook, power of, of internet service providers, power of different platforms that we are using. They have this superpower. And it's, it's, this is the question, how we are going to deal with that? How we are going to, to, to deal with this kind of new forms of democracy? And I really appreciate the, 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 like, all the things that you said. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, maybe <coughs> I would add that uh, uh, there are really, really two principally very different forms of mobilization and participation. And one is really based on emotion. But really people feel that this is good, this is bad, I don't want that. And, and it's very easy then to convey to other people. And we go together against something. And we, uh, for example, in, in uh, this part of the world, we, we have experienced that in late 80s, beginning of 90s. People just came to the street rallying, and it was clear to everybody what are behind that, what values we pursue, against whom we are fighting. And then suddenly, when it was over, the, the tide so <laughs> went away, we were on the shore. And we had to deal with that, to clean up the shore and then start to build there the democracy. And then it occurred that it's so boring, you know. It's so, so really boring. No emotions. And then there was this kind of way to stimulate emotions. Campaign. Campaign, slogans. But in this event, it was fake compared to that initial real emotional mobilization. And, 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 and here we come to this really very difficult problem that when we really like to have participation in this everyday democratic process, not in this exclusionary events, then it's hard work. And it's hard mental work. It's, it, it, it could be made more fun with, with games and, and it is possible but not, 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 not finally. <laughs> so, and, and here, uh, I suppose it's very important that, that we have the structures which really, uh, at first really can, can give everyday support because it's not only digital, it's really human support people need, real human communication, not only through some kind of this mediated tools. And, and then also that they will have, have opportunity and experience of success, that they really have achieved something. 
And then here we come to this problem what we have with this representational democracy, that if we have the over, only over each four years opportunity to, to express our will, then certainly it's not enough, because then, then we leave to some guys and ladies somewhere to decide and, and so how we can come back so that we have everyday opportunities. And here we, in digital situation, we can find, and we really already there are tools which have been used, the, the opportunity for people to have this kind of everyday opportunity for this rational participation. Uh, fun could be there also, because there are a lot of this kind of elements of gaming, but, but really to have that working every day, so that people can have uh, what we call referenda or something, or votings, or, or decisions, or discussions, all over about different things. For example, we will try, uh, let's see, now we'll have new city government in, in Tartu, and we'll try maybe, I insisted to put it in our program, uh, to try the digital referenda on this kind of thing in a city, because digitally it's very easy. You can show more things, visualize, modelize, and then give background information. And then really people can make informed decision, not just for emotion, but really make a choice. That's one part. The other part is really this, this uh, club-like activities among people themselves. Uh, and that all what is coming from below and I suppose that's, that's now the crucial thing, because a lot of people are not used anymore uh, for this kind of everyday efforts. <coughs> and uh, last but not least, we changed our election law recently so that uh, the youngsters from 16 year old uh, can take part in local elections. Uh, and now it was the first time, but unfortunately, yeah, they, they got this opportunity and they are very knowledgeable about everything on digital because they are using it for everything. But hardly they were proposed any content which could help them to, to use this opportunity and also use the digital knowledge to become real decision makers and to influence the older people. I very much hope that, that we can go further, because we have now a situation where in Estonia one third of the population elected uh, through e-voting. But it is not changing quality of democracy, because it, it's not connected with the better content and then the better deliberation. So the, the technology is not solving things. Technology is going, giving opportunities. Thank you very much. But I, I will open it up to questions from the audience. Is there a roving mic or are people just going to... Um, Take this one more. So yeah, just put your hands up if you want to ask something. There's a lady at the back there, right on the back row. Thank you. Uh, hello, good morning. Thank you for the interesting uh, introductions. Uh, I would be interested uh, about this participatory budgeting. So what were the strategies you used into transferring knowledge and giving insight uh, for the public <laughs> to be able to participate in creating and influencing the budget? Since I think that the idea is very interesting and there's also uh, many examples and many p new political is initiatives are proposing that. But then when you come <laughs> to creating budget, you have to actually understand the mechanism, how it works, in order to be able to influence it. Thank you. Really, it's a challenge. And now we are still kind of, you know, strategizing how to do it better. Like, uh, the simplest way is to publish in online on the website and kind of uh, people then share it on social media. Like in Ukraine, uh, Facebook combines the, 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 um, the functions of kind of personal me social media and public political social media, like Twitter, it's also. So like everything is there. So if people share and read, then you can check even the numbers. But again, then you have like educated, uh, middle-aged, uh, male, urban audience, like uh, usual suspects uh, who are in that. Uh, and, they, and they are not, uh, they, it's not guaranteed that they will vote. Um, another way is offline meetings. So we have this, like today, this uh, project's fair, and people come there, can see what's there, and decide whether uh, should they vote or not. Um, like authors of projects, they do mobilization themselves. 
they go for their kind of, kind of neighbors or they post in their Facebook groups and that's it. Um, we also try to in local newspapers like there was a recent article with kind of people from municipalities, civic activists. But what I think is more influential is like uh, television, because more people see that. And it's kind of picture and voice, so video is uh, impressive. But, but it's not interesting to journalists. Like uh, it looks like the journalists want some like, you know, drama. <laughs> and there's not much drama around like regular everyday participation. So maybe we should make it more dramatic. I don't know. The trouble with drama, though, is often it feels very manufactured, right? Or it's, um, you know, it, it, I think it, it, the, your point about um, democracy being boring sometimes um, is, is, is an interesting one because there's this challenge, it's particularly in the media, you know, the challenge is to tell a story in a way which is faithful um, and fair to the facts and to the situation and to the context as opposed to writing the most exciting headline you could possibly write and framing the story in the most dramatic and exciting way, which is what kind of journal, like a lot of media's business model is based on. And, it, and you end with quite an alarmist, hysterical culture. Um, so th there's, there's a problem there. Some of the stuff is technical and, and not very dramatic and exciting. Um, so the, that's a real communication challenge, I think. Uh, you're right, and that's what really I meant when I also mentioned this media logic. It's a media logic. It's a media logic. It, it's, a, it's a business model of the media, logic of this business model. And then it is really harmful because, uh, because when you compare, for example, uh, the picture what you have clicking only on the headlines and pictures, and picture what you have when you really read through the text, it's absolutely different. It's absolutely different. And then what I really, I, I, I cannot agree or cannot take it in when I'm hearing from people, oh, you know, that's like a natural law that now, now people cannot read long text, you know. You, you shouldn't write long text. You, you have to put like in Twitter, you're, you're all, you're, you, you complicated things about democracy and everything. Oh, take it, tell it in 30 seconds and put it in, in two two phrases and in, in, in and and i suppose that's one of the biggest challenges so we are at all times speaking about how to 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 adapt with digital and how to learn digital and i also told about that but but there is another side of the story and that's even maybe some way more serious it's it's to how retain capacity to read long texts how to retain capacity to 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 have complicated thoughts <laughs> and, and, and what we see, um, I suppose you, you know this Kahneman's idea about the, the uh, fast and, and, and slow thinking. Then uh, all this, uh, in this kind, this Twitter and, and clicking thinking, it's a fast thinking. Uh, but really, the decisions which change the world, they are done still, still by people who read the books and who are capable of slow thinking. And then they, they can do it so that nobody really, they are invisible in this sense, because they're working like the, the fishes in the, in the deep waters. Uh, and the small fishes who are the, just jumping there on surface, they have not a clue. And what we speak about transparency, then, then it's also the thing about transparency, but not transparency of machine. And uh, what I, I will say in the, in the end, uh, I was, uh, when we, we made the readership research and then had a conference on book reading, and then we compared the data and then the, and the surveys made also elsewhere in America, and I found a very nice statement in this report about the book reading in America that, uh, yeah, there is still the minority who is still reading books, the majority who is not reading books anymore. And the whole problem is, who will have a power? Thank you. We have another question there, the lady in the yeah. jumper. Uh, thank you. Sorry, thank can you. I ask people to say who, who they are, where okay. they come from, if it's relevant to the question? Thank My you. name is Miriam Kabulevich. I come from Zagreb. With, I'm with uh, uh, journal uh, Buxa.hr and a member of my editorial board of uh, Eurozine. Um, Vladen, I think, that, uh, mentioned a very important thing, that uh, internet is not neutral. But uh, I think we are now in the position where democracy is not value neutral either. And we, we are now discussing it as if 
we are fixing a mechanical thing, how to fix democracy, how to fix this. Um, I come from a country where um, two weeks ago, 168,000 people submitted their signatures for the ban on abortion. And it's a huge number and they, you know, we are in a democratic country, so we have to listen to them. Uh, we are facing in Europe these uh, issues of democracy of numbers. So uh, whether one opinion is as valuable or as another opinion. Um, and I would like to, to hear your reflections on, on that. And um, do we still continue playing them and saying, yeah, you know, we live in democratic um, continent or democratic country. Yeah, some people got beat up by Nazis, but we don't really care because the numbers are not. And what we are facing now is that all these strategies that you are talking about or tactics are being used against democracy, uh, democracy as we know it. So I would, I would like to hear your comments on that and on the Internet, um, uh, internet connecting, uh, connected to that. So yeah, the d democracy by numbers question, um, I think is a really interesting one. Um, do you go first? And then? Yeah, it's a, it's a really weird world that we are living. In. And uh, so, for example, I don't know, in Serbia, we have, for example, we have elections almost like every year, but. It's not because this is like something uh, good. It's because it, this like uh, uh, institution of election it's misused as a as a as a as a method of like keeping people in tension. Because like for example, there is this ruling party there. It's the way how they uh, like continue to be on power because they keep constantly people in a, in a tension mode because they cannot deliver a lot. And what they are doing, they are just like, okay, now new election, new election, new election, and you are all the time in this kind of... So it's like there is a lot of ways how to, to, to um, misuse different uh, democratic institutions for not for achieving different forms of, uh, you know, like uh, not democratic uh, practices. So, and, and, and I think also the, the similar situation, it's, it's with the internet, but I don't see uh, uh, this democracy as something that is there at one point. It's something that is always moving. So it's like uh, something that we should have maybe as a, more as an ideal that we are looking for than something that, that it's achieved, you know, and, and this is like mm, the process. I don't know, I didn't, probably I didn't answer to your question a lot, but and that's my feeling. <laughs> I think well, we have more here like expert in. If I may, I suppose it, it's really one of the most serious, uh, serious problems we face now. Uh, one, one is about this kind of, uh, say, quantitative side uh, in democracy we have been taught in representative democracy uh, on the first place to count the votes or count the ratings and then decide that oh there is majority majority have to have uh, right to decide and minority then have to be protected you know uh, and then there is qualitative side uh, it's about values themselves so for example what you really mentioned also this the, the democracy is not any more self-evident as a value. And that is a thing that is now, I suppose, the most important uh, change going on. Um, in some sense, I suppose, we are in a situation of crisis. Uh, not, not crisis in terms of the political crisis. We are in a very, very deep crisis of European mentality. Uh, and uh, you know, the, this is a crisis connected with our this, the trust in, in rationality, in reason, all this enlightenmental type of approaches, which are now contested uh, by people who are really say, oh, uh, 
emotions are those who are really truthful because uh, emotions you you cannot lie you have this emotion with words with with all these rational things you you can create the the construct and so on but with emotion you are genuine you're authentic and uh, all those fake news uh, are product of that um, and all this understanding or, or the claiming that the democracy is not working because really uh, people are fooled about uh, all those things in reality they feel differently uh, is, are used by Trump uh, by all these people who say, I I am sincere man I am not any kind of theorist, politician, social scientist, journalist, uh, uh, liberal elitist, all, all these labels, they are used to name it to, to, like, to overthrow uh, this kind of world uh, we have been taken for granted for, for three centuries. Uh, and that's a really very serious challenge. And the most serious challenge we have. Uh, and how to answer to that. I, I for example, uh, would start from that, that I would take it as kind of reality what we have, and it is reality, we have Brexit, yeah? We have Brexit. But, but instead of, of uh, only thinking about now how to solve that in terms of uh, negotiations and financial solutions and so on, also have some very serious discussion, what is behind that, what is the reason? Uh, and what is wrong, uh, for example, in EU? And not only in political terms, because what, what, what is happening is that all things are immediately put in words, in words which, which are not really any more, they don't have references. And, and here, personally, I myself, I, I, I always have said that, that uh, finally, really, arts, arts uh, have more knowledge about the world than any science. Uh, and I suppose that it's very important, as we're here talking about culture, journalism, and we're talking about arts and so on, that, that we also reconsider this, uh, this really attitude which have also spread concerning arts in this world of Excel tables and so on, that, oh, art, you know, they are something for for marginal groups who, who enjoy themselves in self-expression, uh, something which is very nice, uh, but, but it is not crucial, it's not fundamental. Uh, and, oh, children have to learn STEM, not humanities. Humanities is, you know, something old-fashioned. I'm, I'm really convinced that we have to analyze the world where Brexit can happen, where Trump can, Trump can happen, also with, uh, with, uh, with uh, this kind of knowledge which could be created uh, by, by having holistic, holistic pictures, uh, having understanding what is going on deeply in, in, the, in the hearts of people. It cannot be done by, by science, it can be done only by art. Thank you, Mario. I think that's a really um, great um, place to end on, but I, I'm conscious you haven't responded to this yet. Do you want to say a couple of quick words? Because we're, yeah, we're, yeah, we're a really short yeah. comment. Like it's a, it's, that's a kind of inspiring kind of rallying call, I think, for the, for, to set the agenda for the rest of the day. I like uh, what I heard was hearts are smarter than science. <laughs> and uh, in a way, we can think about that as well. Like, you know, we live in this <clears throat> logical, rational world, but sometimes people kind of have feelings and they, they have sense in themselves. So maybe we should also add to education uh, emot emotional intelligence, you know? When people care about others, they will not go for some harsh things, you know, because this is a stronger thing. You, you, you're not uh, tell them about values. You just say, like, think about others, like, would you like that or to be done to you or not, you know? Maybe that's also what can be added to our education. Thank you very much. Thank you to the whole panel. Um, and uh, I look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>